Hello, hello, and we are live yet again. And as always, I am here to look for my co-host of the week, and we'll be talking about books, writing, fantasy, fiction, everything in between. And at the moment, I'm just going to wait and see if I can spot my co-host logging on. Until then, how's everyone's evening going? So you hear the little tap taps <laughs> as I search. It sometimes takes a few minutes to kind of have everybody sync together. But yeah, how's everybody's at evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the t world? <laughs> For me, it's after dinner as I readjust. Yeah. Um, anywho, I have a lot of good, great news on the side um, this week that I will be petering out and kind of sharing out with you over the next few days. And just really excited about all of that to kind of share some of these. Well, you'll see. You'll see. If you pay attention, you'll, you'll find out. But they all pertain um, to the book world and what's been going on on my end and have some fun things for all of you as well. But in the meantime, as I continue to check to see if she is live, how is everyone? Aha! I see. Hello. Hello! Hi! Hey! I'm so glad we're able to connect like this. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm okay. It's It has been a long day for me, but you live... I'm in the East Coast, so, you know, for me, it's kind of yeah. evening time. <laughs> yeah. But in case, um, I don't know if you've ever seen any of my lives before, but kind of how I kind of structure them is... I'll let you start off. You introduce yourself. Tell us about who you are, what you write, um, however you like to pitch yourself. I'll do the same just because different people log on through both of us. And some people may not know either of us because they're just joining right. in. And then from there, we'll just talk about books, writing, and everything in between. Okay. Well, um, my pen name is Jolene D. Campbell, and I write... Asian um, myth and legend, uh, mostly with romance. Um, historical fantasy is the main genre of my first series, which is the Iron Blood series, and that's a three book series. Yeah, and I saw on when I was kind of perusing some of your stuff that you have some, or at least one, upcoming book early next year for. Is that a new series? It is, is a new series. Yes, yeah, so that is a new series. So I have one. Um, I hope to have all three books in that series published by the end of next year. Uh, but that is going to be a dark urban fantasy um, romance as well. Uh, but there is a tie-in with that series and my current series. So they do have a connection. Interesting. Okay, I'll have to yeah. get into more into that in a moment. But for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Katherine Weibel. I'm also an author of fantasy novels, my genre is in the epic side of things. And I have three series and they range from young adults, kind of portal fantasy, noble bright, kind of on the more positive adventure, sweeping adventure side of things. Think more like Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. Um, okay. It's set, that was series, it's called the Jed Chronicles. There are two out. The third one will be released early next year as well. And that one's set in a magical multiverse with 12 magical planets. And it's kind of a fun free for all for all different kind of lore and mythologies worldwide. But my other two series, they kind of get darker, a little bit like you were saying about your urban fantasy. Um, I don't know if you can see well behind me. It's a little dark in my room. But I have four book series called the Incarn Saga. And that one's a new adult war shifter fantasy set in a kingdom, obviously on the verge of war, where both the humans and the shapeshifters have to put aside their differences in order or hopefully in order to defend their kingdom against an oncoming threat. And my final series gets even darker than that, and it's aimed at adults. It's a novella series, so they're quick reads. It's based off Norse mythology, so you're going to deal with the people of the Viking era, the nine realms in and around Yggdrasil, the world tree, and we're starting with some obscure uh, mythos and then working our way to some of the more flashier things and beings like the Odin and the Loki. But yeah, so those are the three that I write right now. Very good. Yeah, mine are uh, heavily based on Shinto mythology. Oh, 
Oh, fascinating. Yeah. yeah, so both both have a depth in mythology in our books. Yeah, no, I was going to, uh, my, my young adult series, again, since I am trying to touch on various mythos, and it's been fun using a m magical multiverse because different worlds represent almost different um, mythologies. And so I have one that does kind of dabble a little bit in Shinto, but not nearly as much as you. So don't drill me on anything right now because <laughs> that one's still in draft. But I absolutely love that. So yeah. what got you interested in Shinto lore and myth? Um, well, I've always had a connection to Japanese and Japanese culture. Um, I started at a young age um, watching anime, um, and it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, and then I started starting Japanese language, and my brother-in-law is from Japan. Um, he's born and raised in Japan and everything, and so um, I got to go with him and my sister when they went back. Uh, many years ago for their eldest, who was one at the time, to meet the grandparents and everything. So we went to Shinto shrines and all that. And uh, just, it was touristy, but it just, I guess it, it sparked something. Yeah, no, that's really neat. I think, well, from what I know um, and have read, you know, the Japanese culture is fascinating and beautiful. I've never been, so I'm very jealous <laughs> that you've been able to experience some of that. But I have been able to meet another author at one point who also kind of dabbled in Japanese uh, myth. I think her book, if I, I can't remember her name, it's been a moment, but I think her book was called The Butterfly Crest. So uh, it was something that was my first time ever reading a fantasy, a romantic fantasy based off um, that mythos. Okay, I'll have to check that out. I haven't heard that one. Yeah, so, okay, so let me ask you, you have three books out. When did you start publishing? I started publishing about a year ago last year. So my first book came out beginning in November last year. And um, I have a very similar work ethic to Stephen King, where it's like a full-time job. So I spend, pardon if you can hear the noise, my dog is chewing on a plastic bottle and will not leave. Um, <laughs> That's fine, I love dogs. <laughs> So I, I write, I spend a good 50 to 60 hours working. Um, yep. So by the time I had my first book published, I had already started on the second book and then the third mm -hmm. one was done like that Christmas. So I just took my time uh -huh. last year to just flush them out, edit, do all that other work that goes into that. And then uh, the third of that series was published this past April. Wow, that is so neat. You you are far more advanced than I was at your stage. I I did not know what I was doing at all. And I do like that process that um, you were mentioning about kind of layering things. So while you're maybe editing one book, you're already working ahead on the others in the series. Yeah. So it does help speed up the release process. And now that I figure that out, it's helped me as well. Um, yeah. You know, along with that. Hello. I just saw a little comment says, I'm a writer, too. Welcome. Oh, if you ever see any comments that, you know, you want to like chime out, that's fine. Cause I'll repurpose this on YouTube in a couple weeks. And, you know, so if you want to comment or have conversations that way as well, sorry, chipping that in. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, yeah. Cause my other three and the next series, so they're technically all three of them are done, um, which is really handy, especially since there is a connection between the two series, even though one takes place in ancient Japan and the next one is a little bit more futuristic. Right. Um, so, and because they have that Shinto uh, mythology foundation, they, um, they definitely have some overlapping and there's some elements where like um, there's a comb um that my main character Ake in my second book she wears in her hair and in the first book in my next series they have to go find it it's now a, an artifact they have to go find um and there's a tie-in with uh Izanami with that so um having all those kind of still being in the process of being written while publishing the other ones it kind of helps keep the potholes down I guess or yeah. make sure I <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. And I have some one question that was chimed in from someone. Where do we live? Well, I'm 
in the U.S. in Georgia at the moment, but um, I actually started my writing career closer to the New Orleans area. How about you? I'm in Colorado. Um, Ooh. Out in the country, just outside of one of the major cities um, <laughs> in Colorado. Yeah. Does, here's, here's something. Does... Does anything about where you live influence your writing about like, like for me, I've noticed that a lot of my worlds have high humidity and are warm, but I'm also in the South. So <laughs> when I'm creating things, I, re I realized that where I live kind of does influence and I have to like be careful because I have to remind myself there are other climates, other things and uh, need to adjust. <laughs> I kind of, kind of the opposite, like, cause I've been in Japan, but I've only been there during the fall. So my books take place in all different seasons, but I have to remember things like put in humidity, that that's going to have an effect. Um, and then just like just the different temperatures, because here it's so dry that I have to remember that up an island, there's humidity, it's moist, it's going to have, you know, the sea air and stuff. Oh, yeah. No, it is it is interesting. My first, I've only really been... I went to South Dakota once when I was a lot younger and that was like a drastic experience from always being, you know, living in the deep South and then going that way and feeling the drier heat. Cause I was there for an archery tournament where without the humidity, everybody's arrows were going far higher and we had to quickly learn how to adjust accordingly because yeah. you didn't have the humidity weighing down arrows. And now it's one of those things. Like when I think about when people are shooting archery and fantasy, I'm like, Hmm. <laughs> The little details that you know yeah. someone who has that kind of relatability or experience might um it just gives them that extra bit of reality yeah. yeah so okay so let me know a little bit about your main character who i'm assuming it was she because i see i've seen your book covers and if you have your book covers feel free to show them but um there's a woman on all three of yours yes yeah, yeah so this is the first one and her name's Ake, which means, uh, um, Aka is red in Japanese. So her name's Ake because she has red hair. Oh. And so she has all three. The only one she doesn't have red hair is this one. And it's because technically in the story, she wears a wig. She wears a geisha wig because she, oh. um, she is basically technically a ninja. It takes place a little bit before ninjas are really a thing in Japanese, but uh, in Japan. Um, but she is from the God of Fire in Shinto mythology. So she's actually a demigod. So she's half human, but she's got uh, the God blood in her. And she's known as the last of the Iron Bloods. Um, and she has these powers and abilities that make her strong like an iron sword, but they have a kickback and they actually harm her over time. Um, and... She, uh, she kind of goes on these crazy adventures, and it's kind of like her life story, because um, the first book takes place when she's in her late 20s. Second book, she's older. She has kids. Um, and the third book, it's really a prequel, so it's actually her teenage years and her just kind of discovering herself and life and um, everything that goes with it. Interesting. Now, do you cater the third book as a prequel, or do you just say this is book three, and then people, when they start reading it, realize this kind of is a jump back, you know, in time for your main character? It is listed as a prequel, um, okay. mainly because of how Amazon just likes that. They like to see that as additional material. Um, mm -hmm. I third book, because on the hardcover, I actually put three. Um, but it's written in a way where Anybody, you could start with that book or you could start with the last reader last. So it could be read in any order. And the books are written where just when you think you know where it goes, you read one, you're going to get a whole bunch of, you know, new information. There's tons of Easter eggs. And then you, if you reread the books, they read completely differently because you have a whole new sense of information going into them. Wow. Okay. I have some comments here for you. One okay. saying those covers are absolutely amazing. And um, followed by, is Amazon the best way to find your books? My books are on Amazon, but they're also on Barnes and Noble. The hardbacks and eBooks are only on Amazon along with the paperbacks. Barnes and Noble only has paperbacks. Um, and the covers, um, I did the original art for. Um, and then I gave it to a carbon cover artist who just made it better. 
That, I mean, that's the thing about authors. You learn where your weaknesses are and you have to decide, is this something I'm going to take the time and try to get better? Or is this something that you can find someone to help you, be it an editor or a cover designer, et cetera. So that is really neat. I like that you started with um, one of your works originally and kind of worked from there. Sorry, I'm about to cough. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, so but no, no. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, I did some help with my first books, having somebody else do them. My next series, I have decided to take on doing the covers myself. So we'll see how those go. Oh. Well, I did note in your little bio, you mentioned you're an artist um, as well as being an author. And I think that's amazing since I'm also an artist as well as an author, except my style of art, I don't really want to use for my books. I do pet portraiture, but nothing related to fantasy. So uh, I decided I'm going to use cover designers for my book covers and I'll keep painting pets <laughs> as a different thing. <laughs> well, my, I can kind of see here, like, these are mine. So I already do charcoal. Um, is oh, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but for my next, uh, series, um, I studied document design in college. That was what I minored in. Um, so my next year is because it's kind of a dark, um, urban fantasy and kind of sticking with that genre, they're going to be more, um, you know, objects instead of people on the covers. Um, so that's something I felt a little bit more comfortable that I could handle. Mm -hmm. yeah i know figure figure painting or figure art um that's hard <laughs> that is definitely hard to do so again one of the reasons why i stick with pets and animals and not humans because it's 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 a challenge <laughs> to do that it is and it's just something i've just kind of picked up along the way my mom is an actual professional artist she does oil painting and wow cool landscapes she can do people and stuff she is far more talented than i am i not anything compared to her well everybody starts somewhere and that's where someone who's like starting their writing career might get that um i guess imposter syndrome where you know you start doubting yourself and then if you fall into that too long then you won't challenge yourself to improve and everybody starts somewhere yes there's probably some prodigy who gets it the first time, but a lot of us have to work really hard to improve on our craft, be it art or writing and everything. So, you know, start now and you never know. You assume people may be hiring you to do cover design. <laughs> yeah, it really does take some time because like my my uh, first cover, the, the part that I did this, I actually did Sumi Ink, Japanese um, ink for it. Um, and then what I have next to me here, I'm like, there's a drastic difference um and just the quality so i mean the skill has come along for sure that's so neat i have another comment that popped up saying there needs to be more female representation in fantasy i mean i definitely agree i just remember growing up all the books that were fantasy forward that i was reading had male predominant male characters or male leads and thankfully that's been changing recently and so there are more authors like us who are writing yeah. these fun heroines <laughs> in fantasy yes and my main character she, she is definitely a tough chick she um she's probably like one of the few females in like the entire book but they all have to look up to her you know for you know guidance and like okay what do we do kind of thing so she's she's definitely in charge <laughs> or makes herself in charge if she's not already I I love that. I absolutely love that. Yeah, my my book series, the first two that I started, so the Incarn Saga and my Jed Chronicles, my young adult one, I chose, I like the idea of warrior women leads. It's just something that I'm always drawn to. I want to read more about. So obviously the main characters on those are, you know, very strong, pretty self-confident in, in general um, women. But I also challenge myself to kind of do something a little different with my Viking series because I wanted to approach, you know, a character who may question herself, at least in the beginning, and doubt herself and go through the journey with her of her building her confidence. I still get to throw a strong word woman in, the, in there because I have to incorporate a shield maiden because it's Vikings. Why not? But yeah. it is fun to kind of challenge myself to write something that's less um, 
warrior woman focused and doing something from a different kind of uh, perspective. I will say that my next year is, um, it is a male point of view, um, but I've absolutely loved writing from a male point of view. It has been a fun challenge uh, to write. Um, And it's, I was something I was really nervous getting into. It was just like, I had the story idea and it was like, okay, who do I tell it from? Um, And I had to go with a male point of view on it and I've absolutely loved it. And he is very different. I think, um, I think he comes across pretty well as a male, but you know, just because he is a celestial being, he's a death angel. um, He doesn't come off as your typical guy. That's cool. Okay. See you, you, again, you're trying things um, that I have not had the nerve to try yet. I, uh, my three series right now are all from a female lead, one perspective, you know, just the main character um, style writing. Cause that's my comfort zone. I do want to challenge myself eventually and maybe, you know, write from different people's perspective of different kind of orientations and everything. And, But right now it's, you know, starting off my career, I wanted to work where I was comfortable and kind of expand out slowly. But I have a couple comments popping up. One says, yes, the list of strong women writing, strong women is awesome. Um, Guys writing women is old news, haha. I have a friend who is the best woman on the earth who reads over my women characters. So yeah, I love representation, perfect. And I I have one here, I gotta say hi to Cody. Um, Oh yeah, go for it. (laughs) Mine, and he's uh he's starting to write a book and i've been helping him out so and i caught one of his lives the other last week so hi cody if you're still on no that's like i said always feel free to like pause and we can always jump back into it but no so what what inspired you then you you were saying your upcoming series is going to be from a male perspective was it like how did you decide I know you were kind of saying you might have been trying to figure that out of how you wanted to tell the story, but how did you just land on this character? Um, so in my Iron Blood series, RK, um, she has a lot of near-death experiences. So even though she's got all these powers and abilities that make her really strip and pong, uh, strong, she, she gets injured a lot. Um, and the second book, Iron Tears... Oh, this one up. This one. Um, she she kind of goes through this whole like death grieving process, and then she kind of has like a moment where um, she thinks she might be like you know experiencing like an out of body, um, like you know whether or not she's gone to heaven or something. Experiencing, she always refers to death as a person, and that kind of got me thinking. Hold on. Dog has lost his toy. Um, <laughs> the um, she always ex- she always talks about death like a person, like you know, like talking to him and um, you know, like death is trying to get her down and stuff like that. But it's not like death itself; it's death as a being. And so that kind of got me thinking about something else. And um, so Tenchi is the main character of my next series. And he's a death angel from Izanami, who is the goddess or guardian or queen of death, depending on how you want to look at her in Shinto. Um, and his head um, angel, so the guy that's like his boss, um, you find out he was the death angel to Ake and that he was assigned to her. Just like, you know, we have guardian angels, you think of that premise. So we have like death angels that are assigned to us as well. And so he was the death angel assigned to her. So you hear part of her story in the next series from his perspective, from the death angel's perspective of the events that he was there for and um, how that all relates. That is, okay, that is pretty neat. I like that. I, have, I don't think I've actually heard of that of independent beings of demise attached to people so that's kind of new i think i like that i i do like that and you said um this this first book you haven't announced the title yet i don't think so is that correct have, or have you announced that recently like this past week so i haven't revealed the cover but the title of it is fallen angel tenchi and the coma of izanami um and like i said before the comb is attached to it so in the second book and her hair is home and that's what they have to go find in the first book of the fallen angels series 
Oh, wow. Okay, that is so neat. I like that. I like building your, I guess for you, it's almost like a multiverse too, because it's like, yeah. you know, different times, different entities, but they still all interrelate in some way. So that is pretty neat. So one, as you said, was a historical fantasy um, with romance. And those are some of the words you were mentioning, but your other one's an urban fantasy. So those are fairly different um, subgenres. Do you have any idea how you're going to market to a wider audience? I mean, I, I understand that in the sense that I do giant age brackets between my series and I just didn't know, you know, how are you going to, do you have a plan on how you're going to try to reach the people who are, I love urban <laughs> fantasy or <laughs> um, Asian myth and legend is pretty much like the over, um, the roof over everything so that's pretty much like the main like area um so just trying to like kind of keeping to that market of like the asian myth the japanese mythology um and the legends is as the main genre there and again sorry about the dog <laughs> someone's like by, by the house <laughs> likes attention <laughs> she is our guard dog she is she will protect us from everything <laughs> Of course. Of course. But, um, but yeah, so where are we? We were talking um, pre-dog howling. We were talking, oh, yeah. So Japanese is your overarching um, storyline. So that's what you're going to cater to then. Yeah. Japanese myth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And mythology is the main genre for that. Um, and that's kind of just where I've fallen into. When I first started marketing, I didn't know where to stick my first series. And yeah. that's where Amazon stuck me and it's like you know that actually fits because I started looking at the other books that were being sold next to mine it's like okay yeah they're very similar all right that's where I belong yeah yeah there's a there is a program and I know it changed this name and I always flip depending on I don't know if this this name is the original one or what it's currently called but it's like KDP Rocket or something like that but it's a program that you can get on your computer and for authors I found it, I actually found it really nice because you can do a lot of research of all the categories that Amazon has and comparisons and where you land and try to decide what would you would best slot in because I didn't know when I began that you have 10 categories they're gonna you know plop you in and they'll just stick you in whatever but you can adjust or request, you know, changes in those categories. And hopefully that helps because if you fit in the right spot, it'll help your rankings, which helps you be found. And that's fantastic. So yeah, I've yeah. kind of found second or third book. It's like, oh, wait, there's another way of doing this. All those things they don't, there's, you have to kind of find your first time out there. Yes, I know. I was, I always say that I stumbled the whole way with the first book and it's been a process, but now once you start learning and, you know, I, I make notes, I have like a whole spreadsheet of everything that has helped me along the way, all different kinds of programs or platforms. But, you know, without that, woo, it was rough start. It was a rough start. So actually, since I see one of some, I see um, one of my narrators has chimed in. Hello. Um, I have a question for you about that. So recently, as in this past year, I've been finally starting to put out audiobooks. Have you ever considered audiobooks of your work? Um, a little bit. It's just not something I pursued. Oh, dog is losing her mind. <laughs> Bird, I'm going to protect you. Protect the house. Protect yeah. the world. She's had a rough day. I understand. <laughs> owner and she's not home and she's not liking it um, oh nova you're okay <laughs> um wants i thought about uh, i thought about audiobooks but i haven't ventured into it nova you're okay dog you're fine <laughs> sorry <laughs> Jeez, she's I'm arguing gonna... differently right now <laughs> um so she's um so it's something I've been told I do because my husband, um, he travels for work. And so I give him my books and that kind of helps, you know, with editing and everything too. Um, but he says like, 
he wants me to do it, which I don't, I'm not comfortable with, but he just says like the way that I read it is just so really uh, wonderful. But um, it's not something I pursued of yet. That might be something down the road. Yeah. And that's, it's, it is, you know, I'm just starting to release work that way and um, have some great narrators as Blanca's here right now, but that are working with me for all my series. And it was just, it's something that I really hope Crossing Fingers, it does well, but I've talked to a lot of people and it's just fascinating because there are certain people and everybody has their particular type of format. They like, be it a print, like I am, be it ebook. Um, but audio is a big thing and it's for the people who travel all the time, um, who are on the road and driving all the time. It's a way to read or super busy and have little kids and can't like stop to read a book or the people who can't even see well and have sight impairments and everything. And so it's just another way to reach a different type of readership, which is kind of cool. But yeah, if, as you go along, think about this because I had to ask myself this for my, all my series is do I want a female narrator or a male narrator or a combo? Because my two of my series ha has a female lead, but most of the cast are male. Kind of like what you were mentioning, I think with your first series and yeah. my adult one is kind of 50, 50. And so that's um, kind of fun too. But, you know, you just have to find what sounds right. And Blanca, my narrator here for the Jed Chronicles, just chimed up, said, I spent four hours driving the kids around each day, so I listened to so many audiobooks. <laughs> yes, I understand. Yeah, there's something I um, might actually consider going back to, because um, after the Fallen Angel series is published, as of right now, I don't have any more story ideas. Um, so that might be something, like, I might go back to and start working that process out for those books. But again, I wouldn't know if I should pick like a male or female narrator off the top of my head, at least if not for my first series either. Yeah. It's just something to start thinking about, especially if down the line you might want to go that route. Um, and it's interesting. You'd always ask readership and what, you know, what, what would your readers like for your book? What do they think? Because as you said, your second series is told to the, uh, um, the viewpoint of a male character so just interesting things but you never know you could be finishing up your second series and come up with two more so <laughs> i'm so far they keep spitting off each other and the place and the end of the third book in the fallen angel series where it could spin off again um but part of me is hoping that i'll have like a huge fan base and they'll do fan fiction and then i won't have to do it but um... <laughs> I would like that. I wait. That's what we, I want. You know, fan fiction. That I think that's a that would be kind of a big co compliment. Where someone's like, "I drew one of your characters," or you know, "I'm I did a short story based off of your work." Ah, that's so cool. That would be neat. <laughs> I love it. So if anybody wants to do fan art or fan fiction, I'm I'd be all for it. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. And for yours, I could see it would be really interesting to see if people what kind of style art, if depending on like your covers and your folklore and mythos, if that would affect the style of art people would draw, would they want to do more of these kind of yeah. iconic Japanese styles or would they do something a little more modern that you see a lot of in character art right now? But yeah, and oh, here's a question for you. Have you ever considered having character art done? Because I know a lot of authors here that I've been talking to on this app, really like that of like having a different artist come draw out sketch out their characters and so when someone wants a signed copy or you know is a huge fan and you want to just give them a little extra people distribute that so that's something i've been starting to look into but have you considered that um so in my hardbacks for my iron blood series i do have a tiny bit of art in there there's not a whole lot um I have like some weapons diagrams and stuff like that, that I've drawn oh, in there. Cool. Um, my fallen angel series, I have decided to put in some actual art. Let's see if I can actually turn the camera and show. So this one will actually be in the book. Uh, I like that. So yeah, so that one will be in the book and I'm debating Ooh, well. if this guy will be in there as well. So that's another one uh, that, has a possibility of being in there so those might be actually put in um and all that i do is of my characters um so these are these are all people in the book <laughs> um so 
So that's what I, I have. There. So I like the idea of having something to hand out to people. And I have like a big project that I did with my first book. I received a damaged copy. Um, and I did um, some art with the pages. I cut them out and I did some art on it. And I might mm -hmm. do that as a theme. And then I thought about maybe auctioning them off and doing like a fundraiser or something with them. So I haven't decided yet. Sweet. I like that. That's that's really nice. I've yeah. never really considered, you know, but oh, that is very nice. I've seen some people do like anthologies. So they'll get a bunch of authors together, write a short story, and then be raising money. Um, like what's been happening over in Ukraine and everything. I've seen that happen to pop uh, a number of times, but I like that, the fundraising. Yeah, so that's something I've considered. And again, that's kind of an imposter syndrome problem. And the dog is out again. Um, <laughs> like, I, like, I feel kind of nervous about putting that out there. Um, just, I don't know why, like, writing, writing has been like, you know, it's been hard to get over that imposter system, but putting my art out there for some whatever reason, that's scarier. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's hard, and it's like, well, for anything, um, getting somewhat, well, putting your heart and soul in whatever form out there, and then the fear of critiques, <laughs> the fear of what someone will think. But yeah. I don't know. It's it's hard, and for both the art side and um, the writing side. But yeah, no, it's it is something that I think everybody, especially when in the book community, when someone gets their first bad review, you know, it hurts. <laughs> yeah. But on the other hand, here's the thing: nothing. I don't think there's any particular type of art, um, be it again paintings, drawings, sketches, or even literature that's for everyone. So no matter what, you're going to find someone that's like, mm, no, no, thank you. Yeah. And that does not yeah. mean anything against your, your quality of your work. <laughs> that's just not yeah. someone else's cup of tea. Exactly. So just, just finding the right audience and that's what, that's what matters. Oh yeah. So let me ask, uh, are you a person, because this came up in a conversation I think recently with someone else, are you a person who's able to listen to music while you music while you work, whistle while you work? Um, or do you have to, are you like me, which has to be dead silent and I don't want any distractions when I'm writing new material. I can't, I cannot, but a lot of people have like playlists and I didn't know, I saw some of your, um, I think, uh, look at my book because of the aesthetics and you had some kind of fun, you know, music that reminisced of your style of writing so I didn't know if you have a playlist <laughs> I do so um I have to write with music um and I have playlists for all my books so in my hardbacks for my iron blood series they are printed in the books um and then they're also on my website um and then for my fallen angel series um they're going to be printed straight in the paperback. So they won't be limited just to like a special edition or anything like that, but they will be printed right along with them because the music for the Fallen Angel series, I feel is more poignant. They have a stronger connection. Okay. Um, so yeah, so playlists are actually a huge part of my books. I love that. No, like for me, I, I do develop playlists, but it's either to get me in the mood of writing or, uh, but not the actual writing part or while I'm kind of working on other projects on the side uh, I could be like listening to it while I'm editing or um, working on just marketing those books and have it in the background so I do have playlists that tie into the books but I just can't do it while I write <laughs> I, I, I just can't <laughs> too much distraction going on because I'm that person that I have to like I almost want to sing along with all the songs if they have lyrics and even if they don't it just like puts me in a zone where like I can visualize a scene or a character but that may not help me with whatever I'm working on on the computer at that moment <laughs> I, I find that it helps me write the scene that I'm working on so if I'm writing like if I'm working on my prose if I'm working on like um just like a scene that doesn't have any dialogue in it um that having um 
certain music, I'll usually listen to something that doesn't have any lyrics when I'm writing those parts. And it just helps with like the flow. And it's just like um, the sentence structures for those will be uh, a little longer, a little bit more complex. But then when I'm writing like a fight scene, I have something like really energetic on and something like that. And it's, there's a rhythm that matches in the um, song that will match the rhythm of the fight scenes. Mm-hmm. And so that's that cool. So that's, that's kind of sort of where that pairing of that playlist comes in. Oh, wait. Here's an idea. It's a lot of work, so you never have to do it. But it would be kind of neat to have a special edition where somewhere you have like a side note, say, start this song now. And then while they're reading, you hear it in the background. <laughs> yeah. Just a weird thought. But you can actually have your like cinematic songs as you read. <laughs> Yeah, but doing that, I mean, like, if there was, like, a way to do that with, like, an audiobook version, I think that'd be really fun to do, going back to the audiobook idea. Um, I do try to break it out to, like, uh, with my section breaks, is usually when a new song begins. So there's, like, usually a couple songs per chapter. Um, not always, but um, I put, like, a footnote in there that says, like, uh, you know, at the, you know, that section breaks, that's when the next song will come in on that playlist. So they're listed by chapter. Um, so you can kind of gauge when that song start changeover begins. Oh, that's so neat. I love that. I actually have never heard of someone mention that detailed level of pairing a soundtrack together. So this is, this is really neat to me. <laughs> I love this. I love now I need to like remember to read and listen to your books at the same time. <laughs> Sorry, what was yeah, that? So- I like, I've always felt like I like life needs a soundtrack. Like I always have music on, um, usually I have my headphones on constantly. Um, just, yeah, just music. I like, I do. I like, I feel like I need like a a soundtrack to my life and that just has flown into my books. So. So, okay. Wait, let me ask, cause if, if the music helps your writing flow and you were talking about, you mentioned action scenes, what do you think you're the most comfortable with or what's the easiest or what's the hardest style of scene? Is it like the dialogue scenes, the action kind of sword fights or whatnot, or um, the framing of a scene, you know, all that kind of detail, background detail. Like what is your. Um, I would say my challenge for me is the, I would say transitional scenes, kind of like the background kind of parts of it. Um, Just like getting from like, okay, we need to go from here to here. What do I fill in? How do I transition? How do we get from point A to point B? Those things. Um, I love writing dialogue. Um, I love writing fight scenes. Fight scenes are hard just because of the choreography, just making sure everything works. (laughs) But um, um, we do a lot of martial arts in this house. So I sit through a lot of weapons classes. And so I see a lot of that. (laughs) So that's kind of complicated. Oh, that's cool. Oh, wait. Okay. So you have, do you have yeah. your own um, martial art weaponry in um, your house? The dog is losing her mind. No, but you're okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, my, my husband has his black belt. My daughter is going to be testing for her black belt either this year or next year. I'm not sure which year yet. And she is also the, not only the highest ranking student in her school, she's the highest ranking weapon student in her school for her. So she's, um, she knows like, so a ton of weapons. So a lot of the weapons are featured in my books, especially with Ake, because she's seen a ninja. So all those weapons, she knows, she's built, she has a belt in them. Um, so I sit through a mini, a karate class with my laptop working and learning all these things. And then, um, a lot of time on YouTube, a lot of time watching Jackie Chan. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's always interesting, um, how authors research things. And when you're writing most fantasy, um, I can't say all, but there's usually some kind of battle scene or fight scene. And so it's always interesting, like, does someone, you know, how do they learn or how do they do their research? Is it just on the computer? Do you watch the movies? Do you talk to instructors? And yeah. um, for my my young adult series, 
Um, cause I came up with that idea with my, along with my sister, it was kind of part of our imaginary play when we were really, really teeny, but my, uh, my main character has a bunch of different items. So she's supposed to learn how to do a lot of different, some, uh, majority or weaponry of all sorts. And I always was like, she was kind of like my alter ego. And I was like, I want to learn all that. I want to learn all that. And growing up, I was able to um, take some archery classes and started doing well with that and got a little older and like college got into the throwing axe um, bracket right before it just boomed across the U.S. And um, um, hopefully, hopefully, maybe next year when it, my schedule calms down, I've come in contact and was able to do a private session with a swordsmanship instructor. And that's really neat to me because I was like, oh, okay, I can learn the sword and the pole axe and all that kind of stuff. And that'll hopefully give, you know, that level of writing a little more reality <laughs> as well. It's really yeah. cool because come on, zombie apocalypse, I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, that's very true that the whole like difference of like learning it and researching it because like I do Tai Chi. And we were starting to do Tai Chi sword. And uh, swords are really prevalent in Tai Chi. And it's like, I can write a sword, a scene with the sword, but starting to do the whole like, motion is like, okay, I'm not that great at it in reality, mm -hmm. but I can write it well. So No, it is, it is fun. Like, I definitely, originally, before I, you know, met this man, I had this, I got a couple of books on swordsmanship just so I can just read through, you know, here's how you stand and here's some things that would work. And then over the time got some wooden practice swords um, of various sorts. So, you know, if I wanted to kind of stage out a scene, kind of get an idea of can someone maneuver that way yeah. <laughs> or am I just totally making stuff up, which I have some right to in fantasy, but on the other hand, when you can make it realistic, make it realistic <laughs> yeah yeah i did fencing in college so yeah just taking oh, wow. all and putting that all together and i i have pulled my daughter i'm like okay it's like will this work has this i've had her read this stuff because she's my weapons expert and she's like yeah this is how this works i, I asked your own private weapons ex expert i won't <laughs> <have> now <laughs> that is really neat Oh man, that's cool. So, okay, so you visited Japan and got a lot of influence um, before you started writing. Now that you've written your original trilogy, do you want to go back and revisit that area or because you're moving on with new works? You know, I don't know. I just think it's kind of cool. I was reading recently, or am reading right now, um, Neil Gaiman's American Gods. And in the beginning, he mentioned that he challenged himself to actually road trip across the U.S. to make sure wherever he wrote about, he had ac actually visited. And I thought that was really neat. So I don't okay. know. I would love to go to Scandinavia to do some of the Viking research. I didn't know, I like, would you travel if you could? I definitely would. Um, most of my books, my Iron Blood series, are uh, really focused around Hakone, which is one of the areas that we got to go to. Um, but they go to like Kyoto, Kobe, and some other places, Nagoya. I haven't gone to those places. I will actually love to go to those places. And I feature shrines, um, historical landmarks mm -hmm. that are standing there. And I think it would just be so much fun to do like a tour, you know, yeah. go to those things. In places. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that would be so neat. And I, I'm still trying to figure out to what extent can I write off a trip for research as a, yeah. um, <laughs> like, can we do this? Can, can this happen? Because I feel like if that's possible, every author needs to do a research trip somewhere in the world. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. Asking me, like, when can we go to Japan? When can we go to Japan? Because their cousins get to go um all the time to visit the grandparents i'm like when we can go and it's like well mom needs to sell more books first and then we can go <laughs> that that's true that is true and the unfortunately uh indie publishing is um a little pricey at least yeah. a startup a little pricey <laughs> to get into it but yeah no we that's what we want is to um reach new people so bring another question outside of this platform are you on any other social media that people can follow you and find you and keep up to date with all your work? Or is you, I, are you trying to focus on this? Like, 
Um, I would say TikTok is probably has like the majority of my stuff. I am on Instagram. I am on Facebook. Um, and I actually do post quite a bit to um, Pinterest as well. Um, a lot of that is the art stuff. So a lot of uh, videos where I incorporate my art with my books and everything, those go to Pinterest. Um, the majority of stuff is on TikTok, though. But I do have a Facebook page and an Instagram. Yay! I love that. I love to hear when authors have Pinterest boards and everything because, I don't know, I'm a visual person and... I like, you know, to see what you are trying to represent, see exactly, you know, if you do characters or your world or what, whatever it is, if you have, as you were mentioning different shrines, I don't know if you had a board on shrines that you represent in the book, but stuff like that is really yeah. kind of neat to see. Yeah, and, I definitely, yeah, buy the, of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely by the book and I try to have locations. And so when I make like aesthetic videos and stuff, I try to have like, actual photos or whatever of those places of the actual shrines that take place that's neat like a lot of um well i guess to an extent all my series but definitely my shifter my young adult one because they're on entirely foreign worlds that i created um yeah i kind of don't really have a lot of physical things to kind of post up but my madhouse that is the backboard of my desk where I have sticky notes for days and all the colors and diagrams of my universes and whatnot. I have, I was doing some research on some kind of obscure uh, weapon tree for one of my books and kind of fell in love with some. So I started printing them out and posting on there. And I'm just, I really hope that someone just doesn't glance through the window and be like, what is going on? <laughs> What is this crazy person doing with like? Yeah. It really looks. <laughs> yeah, with my, these pictures because like my office area is in my bedroom, so I have like all these pictures all on my walls. Like anybody who walks into our room is going to look at my wall and just think I've lost it. Up <laughs> here. <laughs> Oh, no, it's I don't know. I love the creative process, no matter who it is and how they approach it. Um, some of the authors that on here, I was one of them I was listening to, and he was talking about one structure where he starts with a sentence and then puts, you know, develops the three act structure and then from there splits them and splits them and eventually comes up with the whole outline, essentially a story. And I'm looking at him cross eyed. I'm like, I can't work that way. But everybody has a different method um, of how to approach it. <laughs> Yes, what you got there, bud. Yeah, I would, it would, sorry, someone commented, but I was like, yeah, that's why I focus my videos this way versus the other way where you would, yeah, it's, it's a mess. <laughs> no, yeah, my, yeah, it's chaotic. <laughs> so since we are rounding towards the end of the hour, um, one of the questions I always like to ask before the end uh, and give you time is, um, is there anything that you would want a potential reader to know about you, your work, what is your last, you know, sell? We talked about where you are, um, but you have a website as well, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so I do, yeah, I do have a website and there's a lot of information on there, all the blurbs and everything for the book. Um, um, even for the next two um, in the series that's coming are on there. Um I don't know. That's a tough question. Why do I want people to know? Um, it's very general in some sense. And that's what always gets people. Cause if it's not specific, everybody kind of stares like the deer in the headlights, but it's also, I think pertinent. You never know. You may be like, we never covered this. So <laughs> I would say as a person who writing a fantasy novel that takes place in a physical world, but with a mythology background and everything, um, I strive really hard to balance uh, the worlds of the East and West, writing primarily for a Western audience, but also to make sure that anybody um, from Japan um, or anybody who has experience living over there or knows the culture really well, they can pick it up too. And they would um, feel comfortable and good reading it and everything. And I know that's, you know, kind of a huge thing, uh, kind of discussion going on, book talk and everything about, uh, cultures and uh, representation and books and stuff like that. And, you know, um, um, I, I have 
relatives. I have blood relatives that are Japanese. And so I want to make sure, you know, it, it represents them, that they would be comfortable with it and that anybody who picks it up and reads it, um, if they don't know it or understand it, that they'll learn something. But those who do know and understand it, they, you know, it, it would feel like coming home. Like there's a, there's a comfort level that they would recognize with that. That's really sweet. And yeah, representation matters. I have a little heart pop up there. But yeah, no, that is that is very smart because as as much as there is a push right now for, you know, a wide variety of representation, you know, the counter argument is make sure you represent whoever those are well. And if you're writing from a different orientation, like you were talking about, different kind of cultural background, you have to put that extra effort in or have find some people to help kind of guide you to just make sure yeah. you do that justice in your writing. And that can be hard. But I did have a question pop up of your, um, do you use any trigger warnings or do you need to use any concept of trigger warnings for your type of writing? Um, I do, because uh, I hit really tough subjects, especially in the second book of my Iron Blood series, uh, Iron Tears. It is aptly named Iron Tears because you will cry throughout the whole thing. Um, um, because like, um, I will take a character all the way to the end of themselves. And I mean that literally and figuratively. Um, so I do have, uh, content warnings, everything's listed, um, on my website. I, in my Airblood series are written in the preface. And then in my Fallen Angel series, they will just be just listed as they are, um, in those books. So yes, they are in there. Yeah, for me, it's one of those things I've, I've been considering, do I? And then if so, where do I do it? I, but, um, and is there, to what extent is there a need? But yeah, it's always interesting when people do talk about it, because I know some people plaster them everywhere, and they have it on their, you know, Amazon, you know, pages and their web websites. Other people um, just say, hey, ask me and I'll tell you kind of thing, and don't necessarily write it everywhere. So it's just always curious. Um how people do that right now. I am the latter where I don't really have any listed, though I do when I talk about my books say, hey, this is for the adults, this is dark, this is the grittier one versus this one's pretty much good to go for anybody, um, enjoy and try to make it very clear, at least verbally that way, but I haven't made that next step to plaster a trigger warning in any particular physical way. Yeah, they're not they're not listed on Amazon, and I did see something like Amazon doesn't like that, especially if you have um, certain sexual content um, to now put mm -hmm. in the description, not on there. But I tried to put it, you know, like I said in the preface or in the beginning of the book. So if you do the, you know, the look through that Amazon provides, it will pop up in those first few pages through oh, that look. Smart. Yeah. yeah, I didn't think about that, but have it kind of in in that first few intro material yeah. but that's actually pretty smart hmm. see I, I learned something new I get a new d idea every time I talk to someone on this so that's why I love doing these is because I'm constantly learning things and I think this is a great <laughs> way to educate yourself and improve in whatever format and occupation you're in okay well we have hit the end of the hour unless there's anything you want to cover any you know, if you have a question, feel free. And if not, I think that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Apologize for the dog telling her head off. Um, couldn't help that as much as I tried. Um, she was having a bad day. <laughs> but no, everybody was... has a bad day. <laughs> bad day. But no, this was fun. This was good. Well, thank you. And I will, like I always tell everybody, I will repurpose this on my YouTube channel in a couple weeks. I'll let you know. Um, I'll put all your contact information below so people can go and find you and read your work. Great. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Have a great night. Bye. You too.